Yeah. So that's probably the non-asthmatic stimulus for her. Yeah. So any, any, not necessarily a malignancy, but any type of infiltrated process of the lungs, wow. either you have like pneumonia or you have like some sort of like, like atypical uh, infiltrates in, in the lungs, that in itself is a risk factor for ADH release. So that may explain, if it's not fluid, if it's not volume overload, that may explain like, like the non-asthmatic stimulus. But there are other non-asthmatic stimulus, for instance. What's the mechanism? Um, it, it's anything that occupies lesions, I'm sorry, anything that occupies space in the lung, it stimulates ADH secretion. I don't know exactly the mechanism, but it's very well established that whenever you admit a patient with pneumonia, look at the labs. There's always some degree of hyponatremia. Um, like other examples, pregnancy. Pregnancy, um, pregnancy per se, like women, I don't know if, if you guys have ever been pregnant, but they drink a lot of fluid, and um, they they tend to they tend to have a little more ADH circulating than than the non-pregnant female. Other examples, for instance, medications is actually the biggest category for SIDH. You guys remember which medications are associated with SIDH? The list is like this long. But lithium, lithium is no lithium causes the opposite. Lithium ca causes the DI, um, diabetic insipidus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's completely the opposite, but. There are like some medications that are very notorious for SIDH. You guys need to know this for your boards. Which ones? Thiazide diuretics. Thiazide diuretics, the, one of the components of the uh, thiazide induced hyponatremia is SIDH. Um, and, and that's the reason why we check labs before and after. Remember, we talked about it last week. Uh, which other medications? They're like a big category. You need to know this for your boards. Antipsychotic. Yeah. It's more actually a lot of the psych meds, any centrally active meds, yeah. but pr mostly SSRIs. So you're gonna be asked questions about like a patient either taking, uh, um, how do you call those medications? Lexapro. Lexapro. Yeah, it, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Lexapro, definitely. So that's a, that's a medication that can that is associated with SSRIs or Prozac, fluoxetine, paroxetine, Paxil, Celexa, you, know, you name them all. Um, but some of the antipsychotics, they can also cause it. Um, um, uh, TCAs are also notorious for uh, SIDH, tricyclic antidepressants. Yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah, so TCAs, TCAs are also notorious for, for um, um, SIDH. Um, 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 NSAIDs. Remember, we talk about NSAIDs. We I, I I cover like a lot of the renal toxicities of NSAIDs, and one one that I didn't mention was the the possibility of potentiating uh, potentiating um, uh, ADH effect in the kidney, resulting in SIDH. Uh, in fact, NSAIDs is one of the treatments for um, nephrogenic um, DI. Remember, there's a central DI and there's a nephrogenic DI. I don't, I've, I've never met a nephrologist treating uh, nephrogenic DI uh, with NSAIDs because NSAIDs and nephrologists don't get along. <laughs> but uh, but that's, that's actually one of the treatments because it, it does potentiate the effect of ADH in the kidneys. Um, so some, some, some medications that we commonly use, um, ARBs actually have been documented to cause um, SIDH. I don't know, was your patient you said? Yeah. She was on, on Benicar? Yeah, so... Um, uh, what else? Uh, let me think. Um, tricyclic antidepressants. Um, the SSRIs. The pills do it. The inhibitors also. No, the pills. Believe it or not, it hasn't been that common. But it's more like the it's more like the the um, the ARBs. And I don't really know the mechanistic way, but it's been it's been documented extensively. ARBs causing it. Um, what else? So pain, chronic pain, is a non-osmotic stimulus. Anxiety is a non-osmotic stimulus. I don't know if this person is anxious. Um, yeah. She's very anxious, yeah. So anxiety is a very well-known risk factor for non-osmotic uh, ADH release. What else? Um, mm, you know, and understand the fluid intake of your patients. Some patients are habitual drinkers. Some patients do drink a lot of water because they heard in the news or they just want to they just want to be healthy and they do a lot of like water <laughs> or fluid intake um, on average if your patient has SIDH you guys know what the management is right what is the management fluid restriction you know it's a water excess problem 
it's not a so sodium deficiency. Once you understand that concept, it's easy for you to offer recommendations to your patients. It's a water excess problem, it's not a, it's not a solute deficiency problem. But a lot of times in hyponatremia, you can have a lot of like different physiopathology coexisting in the same patient. Like in, in this lady, we probably have some elements, like she was on an, on, on an SSRI, she was on an ARB, she was anxious and she had like these, these lesions infiltrating the lung, all of those things accounted. But sometimes we see patients that are very um, frail and they don't have a lot of uh, solute intake. Like I was just telling you last week, she's that frail. she's frail, Perfect. yeah. And then this is a typical patient, it's, it's a lady who probably lives by, by herself. You, you inquire a little bit about the social situation. If you're by yourself, you're very unlikely to have three meals a day and you're very unlikely to cook, you know, and to eat three meals a day. So if you, if you understand a little bit of the background, you need to do that. That's why when I was telling you, if you're gonna think about a thiazide and the patient is already low, low sodium, probably, and he's a frail elderly lady, probably not the best choice because you know that the sodium is going to go down. So, but, but that's probably, that's another, another, another mechanistic way um, that this she patient, got a lot of things going against her. she got a lot of things going against her. And that's always the case for, for these patients with hyponatremia. Um, now off the meds, her sodium is 132. It's 132, and is she compliant with fluid restriction? Yeah, so that's another key thing. You need to teach them because it's very easy to say, but they won't grasp the concept unless you tell him I want you to buy a one liter bottle and <coughs> for the whole 24 hour period you cannot exceed more than one liter and and trust me some patients with true SIDH or severe SIDH when I say severe SIDH if you look at the urine osmolality the urine osmolality can go up as 600 or 700 that means that there's a lot of ADH circulating so those patients sometimes they they need fluid restriction less than 500 cc's in a day go ahead and try to drink less than 500 cc's in a 24 hour period. It's pretty hard. Yeah. So you need to, that's a very important part because some doctors, for instance, some doctors, they end up prescribing salt tablets. And I have nothing against it, but if you're dealing with a patient with heart failure or a patient with cirrhosis, you, the last thing you want to do is to give them salt tablets, right? You, you need to advise them to just fluid restrict themselves. And that's a very important concept. And it is the hardest behavior to change, by the way. Like, the yeah, to, to cut down is, is the hardest behavior because it's a natural instinct we all drink. And for them, it's difficult to understand the reason why they need to cut down. And that goes against logic because they've always heard about like drinking is healthy, drinking goes along you know, with, with good habits. So, and it's very powerful. The thirst mechanism, Dr. Benzer's patients, they're very thirsty all the time. And, and you just need to tell them, if you're drinking, you're doing a disservice to your body. When I was at UCLA, it's a crazy story, when I was at UCLA, they used to have fish tanks. They used to have uh, fish tanks in the CCU. All, all the CCU had a fish, beautiful fish tanks. That, that was at the, at the old, old hospital. I don't know if you guys have been to, to, to the CHS building. It's a, it's a very enormous building. It's actually, I heard it's one of the most complex buildings, you know, besides the Pentagon. It's the second most complex building in the US. Anyway, the old CCU used to be there and they used to have fish tanks. By the time I started my rotation there, they had taken out, there was only one fish tank left and it was in the hallway and they had taken all the fish tanks out. And the reason being, it, it was a patient, there was a patient, he was drinking, he was not getting better. He had a swine gas catheter, uh, like, like some time ago they used to have that pretty standard, everybody had a swine gas. And the guy had like horrible hemodynamics, you know, SVR to the roof and very, very poor cardiac index. The guy was not getting better. He was peeing eight, seven liters and nobody understood what the hell, like this, such a severe heart failure until one of the nurses caught him drinking from the fish tank. So it, this is a very powerful, you know, people kill for water. It's just that simple. So this is, that, this is why this disease is very difficult to treat because you need to do a lot of education. There's no magic magic about treating this disorder. It's just like you need to be on a 750. If you want to go right, probably 99% of the time, just tell them 750. They're not going to like you. <laughs> but once you explain to them the reason why we do what we do, they're more likely to do it. You, you need to tell them hyponatremia can increase your risk of falling. I have a, a physician who, who is a retired pediatrician. He's doing home hemodialysis. And I, I see him once a month. The guy's sodium is always low. It's always low. And, and in dialysis patients, there's only one way that your sodium can go down if you drink a lot of water. There's only one way. And the guy is anuric. 
And I kept telling him, like, listen, you need to cut down your fruit, your, your water intake. Yeah, you know, I, I've been like this for a long time. And I explained to him, like, you, you can fracture, you can, you can fall. And in addition to that, the guy takes all sorts of, like, stuff that he self-prescribes. I don't even know how he can get away with that. But anyway, so he, he fell. He, they just called me two days ago that he fell and he dislocated his shoulders. And I'm sure he fell because of hyponatremia. And you can't really assess for those, like, because they're not tangible things, but you need to tell your patients, this is, for sure you're gonna fall. For sure you're gonna have an osteoporotic fracture if, you, if you're chronically hyponatremic. This guy's sodium was always 129 to 131. So the bottom line, the teaching point for you guys is, if you have an SIDH, a true SIDH, let's say that you did all the workup and you excluded all the other things, because hyponatremia can be, you guys know this from med school, hypervolemic, euvolemic, and hypovolemic. So the hypervolemic, Dr. Benzer deals with it sometimes when you have a patient with decompensating heart failure or when you guys rotate through a CCU, you see a lot of like hypervolemic hyponatremia. And those patients, you know because they're in heart failure and you know because you treat them with Lasix. And they, they start improving dramatically as they, as they they're start improving their hemodynamics. Uh, we also see hypervolemic hyponatremia in patients with cirrhosis. Um, yeah, cirrhosis is a little tricky. Cirrhosis is a combination of hypervolemic hyponatremia and, um, and a lot of like uh, SIDH. The, and, but those patients, the, those patients, they tend to be hyponatremic, like baseline. And they, they're very thirsty. They're less likely to be compliant with your recommendation of fluid restriction. So those are like mostly the hypervolemic hyponatremia patients. The hypovolemic hyponatremia, they usually give you a history of whatever, you know, vomiting, nausea, bleeding, um, you know, like some GI losses or burns. So those patients, we treat them, like it's easy to treat because we just give them hypotonic, um, uh, isotonic saline and they, they get better. So, but the big category in, in hyponatremia are those patients with euvolemic hyponatremia. And for those patients with euvolemic hyponatremia, we use two tests, two simple tests to be able to categorize them. One is called the urine osmolality, and I think you guys did it on this patient. Yeah. And the other one is the urine sodium. So those two tests will give you enough information to, for you to be able to make a diagnosis. So the textbook definition of SIDH is a urine osmolality greater than 100, and a urine sodium at least greater than 40. But sometimes we can see patients with SIDH with a urine osmolality less than 40. And I'm talking about those patients with poor solute intake. If you don't eat a lot of solute, you're not going to pee a lot of solute. That's the way you should remember it. So, but the textbook definition is urine osmolality greater than 100 is suggestive. The higher the urine osmolality, the more likely you're dealing with SIDH. I was just telling you, severe SIDH. I had a patient recently with a, with a urine osmolality of 650. She's in a fluid restriction of 500 and finally her sodium is correcting. But it took me a lot of time to educate the patient and to tell her, teach, teach your patients how to measure that volume because they're not going to understand. You tell them 32 ounces, they're not going to understand it. You tell them one liter, they're not going to understand it. So you just tell them, buy a bottle, this is one liter, and you need to account for everything that you drink. Tea, coffee, juice, whatever you drink needs to be accounted for. Even soups, believe it or not. So, but it's, it's a hard recommendation, but that's, that's the treatment. And I'm saying that's the treatment because um, uh, in the past, we used to treat this idea. You can still find those, those treatment recommendations in textbooks but they're not practical, number one, and long-term is not sustainable because all of these medications have side effects. Um, one of the medications they used to use to treat the patients was a, um, a tetracycline antibiotic that is not used for, is not used for antibiotic purposes. It's called dimeclocycline. So dimeclocycline, if you take it for a long time, it does work, I've used it, it does work, but if you use it for a long time, that stuff can cause nephrotoxicity. And it's not the right treatment because if you remember the physiopathy, the sticks in your brain, it's not a it's not a solute deficiency problem. It's a water excess problem. You just need to teach your patient that you shouldn't, and you need to identify what are the possible non-osmotic stimulus that you can correct or you can get rid of. Narcotics, by the way, can also cause SIDH. I forgot to mention that. So the list is this long. I think there's a website called SIDH.org or something like that where they have like all the list of categories of medications that are associated with SIDH. But for, for practical purposes for your boards, they're gonna, they're gonna give you an SSRI because those probably are the, the more common offenders. Um, okay, so, and then, and then the FDA uh, recently, I'm, I'm saying recently, probably like about two years ago, they, they issued a black, black box warning on these medications, the Vaptans, 
Have you guys heard about the Vaptans? The, 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 we also call them the Aquaretics. They're not diuretics, they're aquaretics because they, they make you excrete free water by blocking the, the ADH receptor in the, in the distal collecting tubules. So this, this group of medicines, they work very well in the, in the hospital setting, um, but the black box warning reads that this, this medication should not be used beyond 30 days because they're associated with severe hepatotoxicity and pos possible fulminant liver failure. So just to, just to show you another example of why the management is fluid restriction. We have medications that help with that. And by the way, patients with SIDH, they also, if, you, if nothing seems to be working, if they have a little bit of SIDH, I'm sorry, uh, if they have resistant refractory SIDH, you can give them a little bit of a loop diuretic, like Lasix. Let's say that your patient really is Lasix naive and normal renal function, you give them anywhere from 10 milligrams a day or 20 milligrams a day and that in itself is enough to disrupt the the sodium countercurrent that occurs in the in the loop of Henley and that that's also beneficial for those patients suffering from SIDH that's another trick trick that I use for those patients that are not getting better just give them a little bit yeah B because remember the thiazides are the ones that cause hyponatremia but Lasix is used for hypervolemic hyponatremia and it's also used for SIDH when nothing else seems to work. I usually try the first approach is fluid restriction. If nothing else seems to work, you can give them a little bit of Lasix. And that, that also helps. That's one of the treatments of uh, SIDH. So... Um, no, bring her in tomorrow. It's all right. later. Yeah, so... Um, Yeah, bring her in and you can give her a little bit of Lasix, a touch of Lasix, that will help her correct. So what are the dangers of correcting someone? You guys know, you guys were asking me when is it safe to send them home. I already told you, never below 120. Mm -hmm. That's the definition of severe hyponatremia. You cannot defend that in court. Uh, okay to send if you're sure you have a dependable patient and they're not having any symptoms, you can send them out. Um, and for mild hyponatremia, 130 to 135, that's okay. You don't need to admit them. You don't need to, you don't need to worry about too much. It's more like a long-term issue, not a, like a short-term issue. But why do we worry about hyponatremia so much? You guys remember? For correcting it? Yeah. For the, like, cell Right. So we call it like, you know, we call it like a o ODS, osmotic demyelination syndrome. <laughs> They used to call it CMP before. Um, ODS is actually a pretty serious consequence of overcorrecting sodium. Um, so there's two problems associated with sodium, and, and you guys are going to get this question. So if you, they're going to give you, a, they're going to give you a clinical scenario where um, a young lady, particularly menstruating young females, are at risk of this. If they, if they, if they take uh, ecstasy or any amphetamines for recreational purposes they usually give them the wrong advice because they tell them like, oh, you're going to be doing a lot of exercise, you need to drink a lot of fluid. Mm -hmm. Those patients, particularly, like I say, females, especially menstruated females, I don't know the, the exact mechanism, they, they have very, very high risk of uh, having uh, hyponatremic-induced seizures, and they can actually die. And the reason being is that if the, if the tonicity of your blood, of your serum, goes down acutely, then the brain cells are going to start like swallowing they're going to get very, very edematous to try to compensate for the, for the drastic change in the, in the serum osmolality. Those patients actually, they develop acute brain edema and they can actually die very quickly. I, we had a lady who actually died exactly the same textbook question that, that I'm, I'm telling you about. She was doing ecstasy and she was told to drink water and there you go. I had another, another very disturbing case. I had a patient that came with uh, hyponatremic induced seizure, sodium of 109, and the lady was, was trying to lose weight. She went to a community doctor. The recommendation, this is a physician, I, I still don't believe he, this guy was a physician. The recommendation from that physician was to just drink water and take some diet pill that he prescribed. It turns out that you guys know that a lot of these diet pills are, are amphetamines, you know, amphetamine de derivatives because they, they suppress, you know, your you know, your hunger sensation. So this lady was told just to drink water, to avoid eating, and just to take the pills. So she started having headaches, and she called the doctor. And the doctor said, like, no, I don't think you're doing the diet, cor diet correctly. Just keep doing what I told you to do, and just come back this week. The poor lady had a seizure. She went to, to the hospital, and her sodium was 109. So on your boards, 
if they give you a patient like like a water intoxication for instance um, you're gonna the other clinical scenario they present you on, on your boards is a marathon runner you know marathon runners they if they're truly professional they know that they shouldn't just drink water they should replete the losses with some sort of electrolyte drink uh, but they're gonna give you a scenario of somebody was running a marathon and drinking and and sure enough the patient presented with um, um, hyponatremic induced seizures. Those patients acutely, acutely, we manage them with hypertonic saline. We try to bring them, that's how you stop the seizures. You bring them, you give them 3% saline and supposedly you're, you're not even supposed to wait for the labs to come back because most labs take about an hour to give you the results. But if they give you a history of like this guy was running and he started having seizures, you're supposed to give him hypertonic saline, 3%. You're supposed to correct 10% of the present, presenting sodium 10% immediately to be able to help them to get them out of the danger zone. So for your boards, if they, if they give you that such a scenario that guy was running and he started seizing, the correct answer is 3% saline, hypertonic saline. Okay, um, so that's the danger with acute hyponatremia, either because you have a person like drinking like crazy, like a water intoxication or a marathon runner or like an ecstasy type of thing, type of situation. So, or there is a, another type of uh, clinical scenario they may give you when they do a TERP. You guys know what a TERP is? Transurethral resection of the prostate. Urologists are supposed to measure the amount of irrigation fluid they give. And they're supposed to measure the amount of fluid that goes in and supposed to measure the amount of fluid that goes out. Um, this fluid is isotonic, but it's hypotonic. I'm not, I'm sorry. It's, it's iso smaller, but it's hypotonic compared to the serum. They use, I think it's called glycine. I think that's what they use. So when I was in, in training, I was a fellow. One of the surgical, um, one of the surgical persons called me. It's funny how he, he, he told me like, I'm calling you with the mother of all renal consults. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what he meant but until, until he, he tru truly showed me that he, the sodium, this patient's sodium was 88. I've never seen anything like that. It was 88, he, he sees on the table, they send lights, and he had like the TERP syndrome, which is a translocational hyponatremia. So those patients, you try to break them quickly because at least you know when, when, when the problem happened. The problem is when you don't know how long the sodium has been low. If you don't know how long the sodium has been low, you need to assume that this patient has chronic hyponatremia. The definition, the textbook definition of chronic hyponatremia is when the hyponatremia has been there for more than 48 hours. So again, I'm going to repeat this because this is an important concept, how you manage sodium. If the sodium has been, if the sodium, if the, the sodium drop happens acutely, it's okay to bring them up acutely. If you don't know the duration of hyponatremia, you have to assume it's chronic hyponatremia. That's, that's an important concept. So, so why is this, is this important? Because uh, after 48 hours, there are a lot of changes that happen in the brain the brain starts releasing like amino acids and, and all sorts of like osmotically active uh, substances to try to compensate for the hypotonic serum. The problem is that if you bring them very quickly or if you correct them very quickly, they're not gonna have enough time and the cells are gonna start like lysing. The brain cells are gonna start lysing. And that's when the problem happens. And, and one of the interesting things about this syndrome, the damage doesn't happen right away. Damage can, can range anywhere from days to weeks. Like, like a hyponatremia case that was reviewed when I was a fellow, the, the patient developed like damage, presented with neurological damage three weeks after the, the correction. So that's why if you, oh, the patient is gonna be fine, he feels fine, we can just correct him. It doesn't happen that way. The damage can happen long, long, long term. And one of the very ominous complications is called locked-in syndrome. Have you guys heard about locked-in syndrome? So that's one of the complications of hyponatremia. Um, like in the 1990s, uh, all of you, where I used to work, uh, they settled like a multi-million dollar lawsuit. Uh, a patient, a, a nursing home patient, ended up developing locked-in syndrome as a result of uh, correction, overcorrection of hyponatremia. So for that reason, there are very specific guidelines in how, to, how quickly you need to correct these patients. If you wanna be 100% textbook, 100% textbook and there's no way, no one can actually get you in trouble, they recommend that you do eight points in a 24-hour period. I usually, um, my comfort zone goes up to 10, 10 points in a 24 hour period, but generally speaking, no more than eight. And I'm bringing your attention because SIDH, you guys have to remember that the half-life of ADH is very short. Like 
I don't know if you've seen in the hospital setting, why do we use ADH for, by the way? Why do we use ADH in the hospital setting? The ADH is a drug, right? Vasopressin. What, what, in which clinical scenarios we use vasopressin? What are the therapeutic uses? Well, you, you use it when you, somebody has DI. Yeah. That, that's the treatment of choice when you have DI. But we also use it, or at least surgeons, cardi cardiothoracic surgeons, they use it because ADH also enhances the release of uh, the von deliverant factor. So the patients, are, they tend to be less coagulopathic after major cardiothoracic surgery. So that they use it in that setting. Um, surgeons generally use it, but like the half-life is very short, it's about four hours. So it's important that you guys understand that because let's say that you admit a patient and the sodium is 122. Let's say that she, let, let's play with this lady. She's 122, she went to the hospital, she's having a lot of symptoms, coordination issues like nausea, headaches, and then you, you establish the diagnosis, you say, yes, this lady has this IDH, and you identify the reasons. Okay, she's taking an SSRI, she's taking, she's in a lot of pain, and I'm gonna control the pain better. She's very anxious, I'm gonna make her feel better, I'm gonna, you know, reassure her. And then I'm gonna start treating her pneumonia. Let's say that you start doing all those things at the same time. So you're getting rid of all those non-osmotic stimulus, and the patients, once the non-osmotic stimulus, they wear off, the ADH also wears off and the patients they start peeing like crazy. I don't know if you've ever seen that, but take a look at the Foley. Most patients in the hospital, they have a Foley, and you can see they're urinating pure water, pure water. So when I was, a, when I was an intern and just trying to understand this concept, like what do you mean like they're peeing a lot? I mean, they, they don't look volume overload. They, they're not volume overload, it's just free water that they, they were able to held on to because of the effects of ADH. And the urine, when you look at the urine bag and you see a very dark, dark color urine, you know that that urine is very concentrated. That's the urine when someone is dehydrated or when someone, someone has a lot of ADH on board, you look, the, look at the urine, it looks very concentrated. Once you get rid of that stimulus, the urine looks completely water appeared, water-like. And if you measure the urine osmolality of that urine is very low, it's even less than 100 sometimes. And the urine sodium is very low because they're peeing, they're peeing like a horse. I mean, it literally, so if, you, if you're treating someone with hyponatremia and they start going in the polyuric phase, please make sure that you, un you, you understand what you're doing because the, the textbook definition requires that you follow sodiums every, anywhere from every two to every four hours to avoid overcorrection. So that's one of the signs of overcorrection when they start like urinating a very dilute urine. So that's, that's number one. So that's, that's the reason why with SIDH, Patients can get in trouble if you, if you don't know what you're doing. Because you admit them to the hospital and then you forget about the sodium until the next day, and then the next day the sodium is 135. You overcorrected 13 points. So then you need to, what, what the right thing to do is to try to induce, we call that therapeutic induction of hyponatremia, to at least prove that you, you try to do something about it. Because if you don't do anything and you discharge a patient home, you know, chances are you're gonna be fine, but you don't wanna be, you don't wanna be discharging that patient home unless you, you, you understood what you were doing. If the patient, that's one of the dangers of SIDH. So on your boards, I don't think they're gonna ask you the more or less the overcorrection, but they're gonna ask you, you know, the ODS, you know, previously or formerly known as uh, centra, central demyelinating. demyelinating CPM, something like that, yeah. Right, right, right. So, yeah, so make sure you guys, you guys know that. Um, but SIDH, the management, the outpatient management is pretty straightforward, but the inpatient man management can be tricky because if they go on the polyuric phase, you have to be on top of those patients. That's actually, I hate getting a hyponatremia patient in the middle of the night because I know nobody's gonna pay attention and, and after they call you, the, the patient, you know, you own the patient. So, but you, you can't go wrong if you measure the urine, the urine output. And like, like, let me ask you a question and see if you understand the concept. This patient has SIDH and 100% guaranteed that the, so the patient is not drinking. 100%. I'm giving you a very hypothetical scenario because most patients drink. Okay. But the patient is not drinking any, any water. And you admitted the patient. Can the patient's sodium keep going down? You admitted the patient, they say sodium is 117. Okay. 
and you're pretty sure the patient has this IDH, looks euvolemic, you're in osmotic of 300, you're in sodium of 50, and... You don't know the answer on the boards, that's just a, a good, you know, <laughs> the answer is yes. Yeah. Can the sodium keep going down? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Only if you had a lot of uh, water in your stomach that we didn't account for. Like, let's say the patient drank and I measure and then, then that water got absorbed. But let's say the stomach is empty and your patient has true IDH, the sodium is not going to keep going down. Because remember, it's a water excess problem. It's a water excess problem. So that's when, when I have a patient with this IDH and the nurses call me, doctor, the sodium is going down, it's 112. What should we do? I know already that the patient is drinking. There's no other way. There's no way of explaining. <laughs> For the first time. That's a crazy story, but it's a real story. It's a crazy story. You talk about hyperkalemia therapy. Hyperkalemia, yeah? yeah? Yeah. So basically, basically have that in mind. It's a water excess problem. Okay? okay. Water excess problem. But that's only for you volumic patients? For you, for true SIDH. Okay. Yeah. So if they have a hypervolemic, that's a different story. But yeah, for true, for true SIDH, it's, the management is fluid restriction and, and the risk of inpatient is overcorrection. Okay. okay. So hyperkalemia. So hyperkalemia, guys, you guys know it's, it's a big topic on your boards. You're going to get a lot of questions about hy hy hyperkalemia. The easy way to remember it is what are the causes of hypernatremia? Just always think about, like, like for everything in medicine, if you, if you have a methodical, like a structured way of thinking, you're going to remember your differential and you're not going to miss important things. So uh, hyperkalemia can either be from overproduction. You guys know which scenarios are associated with overproduction of uh, potassium? Uh, two, two board favors. I'm going to give you like the board favors. I'm not going to give you zebras. So, Addison's, right? no. Well, Addison's can be hyperkalemic, but, but from, from uh, aldosterone, from aldosterone, from hypoaldosteronism, from, from aldosterone deficiency, mm -hmm. but not, not for overproduction. So, overproduction for the boards, uh, rhabdo typical. They found the patient down or a woman that was having a, a, a status epilepticus or some patient that was that had a weird position. I actually got called one time with a, with a consult like a, in the PAC here in the post anesthesia recovery unit and I went to see a patient, bad renal failure and then I always send a CK, a CPK when, I, when, I, when I'm consulted for an acute kidney injury and to my surprise, the lady's CPK was greater than 80,000. I was like, what happened here? So you can get anesthesia related. Uh, it's like an idiosyncratic uh, type of, uh, type of uh, reaction. But you can also get it in the post-top period from awkward like, positioning. Like, like the leg, like, and this is probably what happened with this patient. The leg got cut off, got somehow caught, and um, that causes a lot of like rhabdomyolysis. So, so overproduction, always think about rhabdo and think about hemolytic anemias. So if you, if you see a patient with a lot of potassium, that's probably part of your differential. You need to make sure you rule that out. So those are the, probably the two most common, common scenarios. So the other, the other big category is the translocational hyperkalemia. We all know that the potassium is supposed to be an intracellular ion, right? So f there are some clinical scenarios where the potassium is shifted from the intracellular space to the extracellular space. You guys remember? Some of those scenarios? From the intra to the extra? Mm -hmm. yeah. Excellent. Metabolic acidosis. That's, that's actually one of the most common causes. Um, um, insulin deficiency is another common. And that's the reason why your patients, when they present with, uh, with uh, DKA, they're usually hypokalemic, but then they start becoming hyperkalemic. Uh, what's that? ACE inhibitors, yes. That's decreased clearance. I'm going to talk about that's a bigger, another big category. But uh, translocational happens in those two settings mostly. Um, uh, you can also get in in the in the respiratory acidosis, respiratory respiratory acidosis, but that's less commonly seen. But it's mostly metabolic acidosis, insulin deficient states. Yeah. So those are the two big categories. Um, then decreased clearance. Who's responsible for potassium clearance in the kidney and in the body? I told you the answer. In the kidney, right? So about about 90 plus percent of the potassium clearance happens in the kidneys. Some of that clearance happens in the gut, 
And that's why it's important if you have kidney disease patients, you ask them if they're constipated, because they shouldn't be constipated, because they got some, some, um, some uh, adaptive mechanisms. Um, patients with advanced kidney disease, they, they, they got participate more in potassium clearance. So make sure you always inquire about constipation in your chronic kidney disease patients. Um, and we cover the foods. I see two new faces here, but uh, you guys remember what are the foods high in potassium? Avocados, what else? Bananas, potatoes, very good. What else? Squash, right? Squash. A lot of the red, orange fruits, papaya, mangoes. Yeah, so coconut drinks, coconut water is big, is a big category. Um, seaweed, molasses. Yeah, so make sure you guys potatoes, tomatoes, avocados, uh, beans. So you need to know this because you you don't want to you don't want to miss the, the the diet aspect, especially when you prescribe this group of medicines. Give me a favor. Oh, maybe you can help me connect the, my computer here. Oh yeah. Yeah. So okay. So decreased clearance, overproduction, translocation, and hyperkalemia. And there's a big category called pseudo hyperkalemia. And when, when, when do you think this happens? Pseudo hyperkalemia. We see this in clinical practice. I see it all the time. So pseudo hyperkalemia is a diagnosis of exclusion when you rule out other things. But typically it's a patient with normal renal function with no, no clear reason to have high potassium. And then you ask the patient, you ask the lab to do the labs without a tourniquet and the potassium is normal. So there's a lot of um, lysing of the red blood cells, especially in the labs where they have like student phlebotomies, <laughs> they're learning. Oh, and uh, you, see this, you see this quite common in clinical practice. So if you have a high potassium, you have no, no good reason to have a high potassium. You know, remember the homeostasis of potassium is pretty tightly regulated. For, by the same token, if you have low potassium, you need to, you're kind of obligated to investigate why, why does this patient have low potassium? Same thing with high potassium, why, why does this patient? But we also see pseudo hyperkalemia in the setting of like hematologic malignancies, um, like patients with platelet clumping. Um, that's like a falsely elevated potassium. So it really has no clinical implications in terms of management, but you need to document the reason so you don't, you know, you don't chase your tail like, like doing workup, that unnecessary work. So, okay, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't really understand the, the phlebotomist, the, the... Destroy, destruction of the membranes of the red blood cells and lysine and release of potassium. Okay, okay. Yeah, so it's, it's quite common. So make sure you guys, if it doesn't make any sense, just tell the patient next time, you're gonna, you're gonna, get, you're gonna tell them to get the blood draw without a tourniquet. I got a patient that he was so, so grateful. It's a guy with uh, interstitial lung disease uh, sent to me for hyperkalemia. And that's all I did. I just sent him to the lab and I told him, do not use a tourniquet. The guy, he was so appreciative. He told me like, I, you have no idea what this mess for the last year they caused. Like, I, I, I had to stop. I'm already dying from this lung disease. And they, they told me to stay away from everything that I loved to eat. It's a big deal. It's not a big deal in terms of like outcome, but it's a big deal for the patients because why are you gonna restrict their potassium intake if they don't, if they don't have to? So if you, if you don't have an explanation, you do all the workup, pseudo hyperkalemia is part of the differential diagnosis. Okay? So, okay. So management, management of hyperkalemia. So um, the most common, the, the, the most important thing is to identify what is the physiopath behind. If it's hemolysis, you already know. You know, sometimes when the hyperkalemia is so severe, we just have to dialyze the patients. But before we get to that, there are multiple strategies that we can do in the hospital setting. I'm gonna talk about strategies in the hospital setting and in the outpatient setting. In the hospital setting, usually you identify what is the cause. If it's hemolysis, you can, you can play around with uh, medicines. We com very commonly use chiaxolate, which is a, you know, a binder, a resin binder um, that binds potassium in the gut and, and, and patients hate to take that medicine because it causes a lot of diarrhea. Um, and, uh, but that's pretty commonly used. What are the contraindications of using chiaxolate? You guys know what are the absolute contraindications and relative contraindications? Can you repeat the name of the medication? Chiaxolate. It's also known as uh, Kionex or sodium potassium polysaccharide, I think is the name of it. Do you guys have Hippocrates? Yeah. So, do you guys know what are the absolute contraindications? 
So make sure you know that because um, all doctors use it like candy and you can, you can actually hurt people with, uh, with chiaxolate. So if you have a post-surgical state or ileus or some, any, any type of obstruction, you do not use chiaxolate because chiaxolate, before they used to combine it with sorbitol, there was a preparation associated with sorbitol, which is a um, uh, osmotic uh, laxative. Uh, to you know, to enhance the the effects of uh, chiaxolate, uh, more and more case reports came up about intestinal necrosis. So, um, by definition, you do not use chiaxolate in somebody with questionable intestinal motility because it's dangerous. So that's one thing. So, in the hospital setting, we use other things. You know, like in that order of ideas that we talk about, like translocational insulin deficiency. That's the reason why we. Um, um, we stimulate insulin production by giving the patients D5. So if you, if you have a patient that is not in DKA or, or a severe uncontrolled diabetes, you give them D5 and that stimulates endogenous insulin production and that also brings down potassium. So you can give them a little bit of like, let's say D5 half an S or D5 an S and that, that helps with um, uh, shifting potassium to the intracellular space. Um, you give them insulin um, that's another another common strategy for the same thing. It causes translocational uh, translocation of the potassium. Um, we use beta two agonists in the hospital setting because beta two also causes sh uh, shifting of the potassium from the extracellular to the intracellular space. You guys know albuterol, right? Yeah, albuterol. We use it. We use it obviously for COPD, asthma, any type of lung issues. But we also use it for hyperkalemia. And I think OB doctors, they use it a lot for preterm labor. Um, what do they use it for? for yeah, it's um, to stop uh, preterm labor. It's actually, it's actually um, how do you call it, tocolytic. And that's how they call it, tocolytic. Okay, um, so that's another strategy that we use. If the patient is acidotic, sometimes doctors give uh, bicarbonate. Um, bicarbonate uses the same thing, your correction of acidosis, shifting of the potassium from the extracellular to intracellular space. Um, how do you prescribe bicarbonate in the hospital? You guys remember how do you prescribe bicarbonate in the hospital? So you can either give an amp, you know, each amp has 15 milliequivalents of bicarbonate, sodium bicarbonate, or you can ask the pharmacist to prepare an isotonic bicarbonate drip by mixing one liter of sterile water with three amps of sodium bicarbonate. I remember I told you 50 mil equivalents roughly, 50, 50, 50, that's 150. That's very close to isotonic saline, which is 154. So that's how you, that's how you do it. Um, um, I always tell students and residents, fellows, if you're gonna prescribe um, uh, sodium bicarbonate infusion, understand what are the possible complications of a sodium bicarbonate. Everything has a complication, right guys? If you prescribe normal saline, you can induce stuff. Same thing happens with sodium bicarbonate. If somebody has like severely hypertensive, you're gonna become more hypertensive. Um, if your patient has hypocalcemia, they, they can become severely hypocalcemic if you give them sodium bicarbonate. So it's a relative contraindication for using, for using sodium bicarbonate intravenously. And if the patient has hypokalemia, you can actually kill someone if you give them sodium bicarbonate. I'm gonna tell you a story from my training days. Um, an HIV enteropathy patient presented with chronic diarrhea and with a um, non-GAP acidosis with a potassium of 2.8 and a, uh, a bicarbonate of 10. So the patient, the, the team that admitted the patient, they failed to recognize that the most important electrolyte abnormality was not the was not the metabolic acidosis. They they all got they all got excited because they realized like oh my gosh this guy's bicarbonate is ten, but he was compensating just fine. You know like we always talk about anemia patients walking around with a hemoglobin of four or like a, a pericardial effusion chronic pericardial effusion versus an acute. Same thing happens with chronic metabolic acidosis. He was just fine. So the team failed to recognize that the problem was not the low potassium. They, they thought, oh, the problem is actually the, 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 the low, low bicarbonate. So they put the patient on a bicarbonate drip. The next, next thing that happened is that the patient coded. He didn't die, but it was a, it was a totally avoidable complication. So you want to replete potassium before you correct hy uh, hypokalemia because 
hypokalemia is uh, expected. It's not even a side effect. It's an expected outcome of giving someone sodium bicarbonate intravenously. So you make sure that you, you follow that electrolyte very closely. Okay, so that's another strategy in the inpatient setting. Um, and last resort is dialysis. I've, I've had to do dialysis in patients that they're still making urine when there's nothing else that you can do to bring down the potassium and they have a life-threatening emergency. And I'm saying life-threatening by EKG abnormalities or like conduction abnormalities. So always a good concept that you guys understand is dialysis requires some preparation. It's not like, oh, I need dialysis, I'm gonna give you dialysis right now. We need to put a line and we need to make sure that line is functioning Especially if it's a net line, I need to do an x-ray, make sure that there's no pneumothorax or the line is not, you know, in, in some other place. Um, so you have, to, you, have to, you have to understand that the minute that you call the doctor to put the line, by the time the line is in, by the time it's confirmed the position, and by the time they're able to prime the machine and they're able to, to start the patient on dialysis, there's some time. Probably in the best scenario is about two hours, probably... In the, in the UCLA CCU, we can get it probably within an hour, but there's some time. So it's almost never the, the treatment right away, but it's a, it's a possibility. <laughs> uh, single pass dialysis, there's different types of dialysis. Uh, if you rotate through you know, tertiary center, you're gonna see something called CRT. It's continuous renal replacement <coughs> therapy um, versus single pass, which is the bedside machine that the technician goes in and it gives bedside dialysis. Single pass dialysis is a lot more effective correcting hyperkalemia than, than any other types of dialysis than compared to peritoneal dialysis or compared to CRT. But that's how we, in the hospital setting, that's how we do it. Um, especially in a patient with, uh, I mentioned hemolytic anemias, um, rhabdo, and another, I've, now that I remember, another clinical scenario that you guys are gonna get on your boards, guaranteed, it's a patient with tumor lysis syndrome. Have you guys remembered, have you guys, have you guys uh, got any questions when you're practicing about tumor lysis? So who gets tumor lysis syndrome? You guys remember? People on chemo. People on chemo, especially like, like hematologic malignancies, like patients with a lar large tumor bur burden, like let's say they have like, like a large B cell lymphoma with bone marrow infiltration, like, like a lot of like, like um, tumor burden. They get, they get tumor lysis. And tumor lysis is manifested by uh, acute renal failure, hyperkalemia, hyperphosphatemia, and hyperuricemia. So if they give you those, those hints, you know that you're dealing with tumor lysis or in anticipation. Like the prophylaxis that we do for these patients, we give them some allopurinol, and then we, we start treating them with